Hello, and welcome to Smart Karma's Webinar Wednesday. I'm Michael Tagos. Today, I'm excited to be joined by David Lepper, who will help us understand more about the rise of activism and its impact on boardrooms in Asia. David has produced a very interesting three-part Smart Karma original insight that goes in-depth into the topic, including a breakdown of activism and how it works and a roadmap for the coming year. I really encourage you to read it after this webinar if you haven't already, as it expands meaningfully on everything we will talk about today. A few words about David. He is the managing partner and founder of SR Services, a firm focusing on strategic knowledge and solution provision to global family offices and corporate businesses. Prior to founding SR Services in 2011, David spent 15 years in investment banking and asset management based in Australia, Asia, and the Middle East and North Africa region. He has held senior positions in BNP Paribas, UBS, and HSBC with a focus on public and private company special situations and strategy. David, thank you very much for uh, joining our webinar and welcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for, uh, for providing the forum. I think what we want to do... It's a pleasure. Yeah. I think uh, the, the way to possibly sort of pitch this is to go through a little bit of the trends that are going on, Michael. Um, I think the, the overall uh, sea change that we're seeing in both in global markets and in particular across the Asia-Pacific are worth, uh, worth exploring before we get into uh, some of the, uh, the, the areas that I know that our, our listeners will want to focus on, as in can you see performance within activist stocks uh, and how to, how to select them. So I'm just going to go back through a little bit of uh, the, the statistics um, of the global um, stage first, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move through. But I've sort of started off with a bit of a broad definition of shareholder activism. We all uh, pretty broadly know what it is, but it is about influencing a corporation's behavior um, or by shareholders. And in, in short, the key topics that really uh, encapsulate what shareholders uh, activism is about is about balance sheets, board related business strategy, M&A, and governance, uh, as well as remuneration uh, coming through. And the key points behind that is the, uh, the ability to affect change and either be through influencing the agenda or actually instilling, um, instilling directors to represent shareholders in a more meaningful manner or minority shareholders in particular in a more meaningful manner. Uh, and that's really the, 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 the definition of what we're talking about uh, today. More importantly, though, I think what is a big sea change globally is that it's becoming more prevalent that you see public activism coming to the forefront. And that public activism coming to the forefront is the one that's really driving the headline statistics that we all start to see today uh, and, and really uh, driving the, uh, the merits of, um, of following the activist-led stocks. Um, yes, we certainly know the household names uh, of Carl Icahn and uh, in the Asia-Pacific region uh, from the, uh, the 90s, be it Bond, Skase, Elliott, uh, Brearley, uh, as well as others uh, come through. But the global activism trends that are, uh, that are coming through today, we're seeing a, on, on public campaigns, and this is important. Um, yes, activism probably starts with a private conversation, but the global activism and public activism is still delivering some pretty healthy growth there. In the number of total number of campaigns, we're seeing around 6% growth globally. Um, but more importantly, as we get through to, to Asia, we're seeing around 10% growth come through in public uh, campaigns. Now, what's most important about that is that the mix of the, uh, the campaigns, uh, and I referred to obviously the more the household names, the mix of that is seeing some of the more non-traditional activist uh, investors and shareholders being brought to the forefront of public campaigns. Uh, and we'll dive into the reasons behind that in a minute. But, you know, if we go back, not too far away, but go back around five years, uh, and we're looking at only those non-traditionalists representing only about 35, 36% of the campaigns. As they sit there today, globally, over 40%. 
uh, and I think it will increase uh, as we uh, go forward in the next decade. Not always through choice, but it will increase. What's important about our forum here today and why we're, we're looking at Asia Pacific is that actually if you go back over time, uh, Asia back in 2010 uh, had a recorded public um, activist campaign according to Activist Insight of only about one campaign uh, that was public. Today, we're seeing much more than that. Uh, and we're seeing essentially it represent around 20% of, uh, of, of the global activist campaigns. And within that 20 odd percent, we're seeing some markets accelerate in their contribution. We've always seen Australia there. Uh, it's been very close to the UK and the US markets in terms of the sizes. Uh, but more importantly, if we go back uh, to 2013, Japan was definitely not in the number three spot that it sits in 2019 by campaign counts. Why is that occurring uh, and where is it occurring? Uh, this, is the, this is the key, uh, key area. You're seeing five key sectors coming through as, uh, as, as sweet spots for the activists. Uh, we're seeing a number of global campaigns being focused on the, uh, the what I'd sort of say, globally as a small cap sector, not necessarily for Asia Pacific, in the sub, but in the sub $2 billion market cap space. And we're seeing that because people are actually recognizing that, uh, that you can influence the, the agenda and the change. Um, but most importantly, what we're seeing within the, uh, the activist uh, space is that 60% of the activity is in literally five key sectors, um, basic materials, uh, the consumer cyclicals, industrials, uh, and yes, surprisingly, in some cases, technology. Uh, and whilst it hasn't necessarily reflected in Asia, um, I don't uh, foresee that technology will be immune from it. Uh, we've certainly started to see it in Japan coming through. Why is it becoming more impactful? Uh, I think the number one key driver behind it is the ESG sign-up. Uh, that we've seen globally. Uh, according to Lazard's, we've got 17% growth in the number of signatures by asset management, assets under management uh, coming through in the, in the world. And I think that is a uh, certainly um, a key driving force uh, and a very good reason as to why the non-traditional activists are being drawn into it because of the fact that they've got the ESG programs out there, they're having to come through. But we're also starting to see that we're within Asia as, uh, as it matures, activism is coming through. And, uh, and it's been driven by the international investors coming to, to Asia due to changes in corporate regulations and codes, particularly in Japan. Uh, it's been driving all the successes that we've seen from those international uh, activists are starting to embolden the activists in Asia to uh, to come through. But as we've gone through in the last decade, we've also seen macro and company specific reasons start to drive uh, a need for shareholders to actually step up, as well as the fact that we've got the codes. But that has also been aided by the fact that governments and regulators are starting to make changes that reflect more of the minority shareholder rights uh, than the traditional uh, family-led uh, institutional um, uh, offerings that, uh, that, that, that are present. If we go into and dive into Asia in a specific um, market for, for activism, we see some quite interesting uh, changes. And our, our key conclusion um, is that activism is creating a new era of change within the market. In particular, if you carve down to the campaigns that can be identified as traditional and non-traditional, uh, we've seen about 11% growth. And we do have obviously the 10% uh, the number in there, but this is really on defined campaigns uh, that have got the, uh, the, the, the campaigns in there. But that 10, 11% growth, we anticipate in the next uh, five years to actually continue to be seen. And I think as we'll talk about 2021 in a minute, it could actually be a bit of a catch up as we come through. The various areas of um, 
if you look at Asia Pacific as a, as a total market, the various areas of campaign uh, can be a little bit misleading, but we see a very strong concentration on balance sheets and board related issues. Um, the other areas of governance certainly are, are prevalent and probably at times can take uh, can take a, um, a degree of uh, headlines. But as we see it, it's very much about the boardroom and how, how the boards and management are interacting with their investors uh, to come through. We expect to see the greatest growth though in Asia Pacific, ex Australia, uh, for a very um, re simple reality that the, the regulations are changing specifically uh, in Asia. Australia has also been a very mature market as a classifier uh, for a while within uh, activism land. As we see it, break, as I referred to uh, earlier, we, we looked at the, the overall sort of campaign types and we've broken those down by statistics. And what you actually sort of see it within um, a Japanese context is the balance sheet is very much driving the, uh, the, the course for change. People looking at the, the cash that in a large amount is sort of held on balance sheets, looking at the assets within the conglomerate structures, looking at the way that management are actually enacting uh, their strategies uh, to come through and very much focusing the campaigns on that. You're seeing other areas being ignored simply as a result of looking at the, the code, but also the reality that the activism, so activists within Japan have had some very good success there. Whereas if you look at Australia, which has come through uh, in some degree of maturity, but has a very sophisticated investor relations and um, corporate code uh, and shareholder code, um, we see less of the, uh, the, the focus on balance sheet and very much a focus on the boardroom. Uh, that is, you know, no mistake. Australia's investor relations efforts are out there talking to people about the uh, the topics of remuneration. Uh, but certainly, and and they're also focusing on the on the way that they present and the way that the company is uh, presenting its governance uh, code there. So as I as I sort of see. Those trends, I don't expect them to change in a significant manner in the next couple of years. Uh, it is simply a nature of the market and the way that it's been uh, operating. Other areas just to focus on and, and perhaps to talk to a little bit of uh, the history of it is the key areas across Asia that have seen the change and the reason why we see the changes uh, coming through were largely driven out in 2013 uh, within uh, Japan when Shinzo Abe came to power and essentially looked at uh, upgrading uh, the corporate governance codes, the M&A guidelines, uh, and also um, the, the ability to basically have the boardroom being a little bit more responsible towards the minority investor um, and not being driven by its cross shareholdings. Having said that, there is some protection with cross shareholdings um, and the, the area that I think that we will need to focus on in the next 12 to 24 months is that as Shinzo Abe leaves office, uh, how the corporates are going to react to that, whether there will be any sort of uh, kickback to the, um, to the regulatory changes that have uh, been brought upon them, or whether or not we actually see a continuation of the, uh, the improvement in uh, activism environment within Japan. Uh, other areas to, to, to really note uh, that South Korea has already had a well-established um, level of activity of activism. We've seen that through the market reforms uh, and we anticipate that that will continue, although there will be certain hurdles that need to be overcome by some of the, some of the, uh, uh, the corporates and also the activists alike. Taiwan, uh, I'm pointing to a simply a steady changer probably the one that's probably going to have the least profile in change, but it will make change. The one that will probably have the highest level of profile, or the two markets in particular will have the highest level of profile, will be Hong Kong and China, um, simply because Hong Kong and China always seems to have 
um, some high, higher profile activist uh, activities, um, be it Bank of East Asia or, or um, other um, notable banks uh, over the years. Uh, but more importantly, Singapore had last week a very significant um, win for activists in the Savannah REIT um, uh, activist program, which I think will take some time for the, for the Singapore investment community to absorb, but it does actually show that activism is supported by the, um, by the relevant um, regulators and authorities uh, to, uh, to be well run in that area. And I think people will be emboldened as, um, as similar campaigns come through um, around minority shareholdings and ensuring that majority shareholders or, um, you know, I would say management and boards are held to account uh, for, the, for their actions. I brought India on that chart because it is a significant market and, and it's been a slow burn um, type environment where change has been coming, but there needs to be perhaps a degree of confidence to come into the, uh, into the institutional market there that activism can, can move. But you've got a separation between ownership and uh, management that hasn't necessarily um, been a significant separation uh, and may need to, uh, to occur um, over time. But it is a market to watch, uh, certainly. As we come through, the question that I think everyone is asking is, can activists actually uh, influence change? And uh, can we actually see some form of outperformance by having exposure into the, uh, into the stocks? And what I really want to um, emphasize here is that there is no real set formula to, to measuring success of campaigns. Um, but there, is, there are a couple of guidelines that we have pointed to in our report and we will continue to monitor. And that is simply um, the, the level of sort of contested votes uh, in seats one. Uh, we will also be me measuring the, uh, the settlement um, uh, compromises that management may make by appointing people to the board to deliver both governance and also um, influence of, of change. And what's important about that measure is that as you break it down, there are certain um, nuances within the various uh, markets and also ability to win it, um, for an activist to win. So therefore to take Asia Pacific as a whole is going to be a little bit of a misleading uh, side of it. In Australia, you see probably a de higher degree of settlement simply because of the interaction from the investor relations uh, efforts that management have. Um, but you see a fairly even balance for the activists wanting to get seats and, uh, and winning it, although noted 2020 has been an unusual year. What has been, perhaps been the, um, the standout though is that in Asia, you're seeing greater um, greater chances of activists uh, gaining board representation uh, coming through. And that is something that I think is in particular uh, driven by Japan's efforts uh, for the minority investor to have um, their rights uh, exhibited and for the boards to actually um, engage in, the, in that conversation. One of the more sort of absolute ways of measuring, uh, measuring success of an activist is obviously in the share price and the performance. What we did here, and you'll see it in greater detail within the report, we formed a series of indices at different thresholds of the share register. We took set, uh, scanned through 6,700 uh, constituents that the S&P Asia Pacific BMI has, and we picked stocks that had known activists on their register and divided that into a variety of levels, um, starting at 1%, going all the way up to 19.9%. The reality is, as you come through several factors, uh, owning a stock that only has 1% holding or less of an activist investor can actually see underperformance come through. 
much of that is a result of the um, the agenda not being um, clear of the, either the activist or the influence that they have within the stock. But what becomes interesting is as they get to three and a half percent, you start to see quite um, a degree. Two things come through. The first of which is it's probably the area of highest volatility, um, but you start you do actually start to see a degree of outperformance coming through. The drawdown risk is quite high at three and a half percent because the market is not sure as to whether the activist is going to be successful in the campaign and their influence um, through time. However, as the share register passes through around seven percent and trends towards about nine point nine percent, you really do start to see the level of incremental return coming through. But what we learnt coming through is that once you get above about thirteen and a half percent. 14% of the holdings, that's where you don't necessarily get an incremental return. It becomes a crowded register. Most of the trade is, is largely gone at that point. And as a result, you know, if we were looking to trade them as outsiders or had exposure to, to that area, uh, then certainly that's where um, you, you will see the influence start to, uh, and, and effect within the share price start to less uh, come through. As we come through, um, we do see a number of themes that are emerging within uh, within Asia, uh, and will continue to, uh, to 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 drive that um, that uh, that flow. Um, firstly, you will see the groundswell uh, gaining on the ability to speak out. Uh, this will be driven, obviously, by ESG and the fact that uh, some of the signatories will feel obligated to, uh, to, to speak out for those the purposes of that code. You are also starting to see a generational change in both management and boards within uh, the Asian uh, environment, but you're also starting to see a generational change within the asset managers coming through who are schooled in, in activism as not activism not necessarily being hostile in nature but can be proactive and a partnership within the uh, within the communities. And that is also being fostered by the legal and regulatory reforms that we're coming through. What in particular we do expect to see, and we've started to see um, in the last three, four years, is that the local homebred activists within Asia will become more prominent uh, within the campaigns. Part of this is because of the fact that you're starting to see um, uh, the individuals uh, come out of the uh, out of the major international funds and form their own funds, but also in the fact that people are actually realising that asset managers, um, both big, small, and um, uh, can can come through and be activists in their own rights without having to uh, to have a specific um, international uh, skill set that's been largely bred out of the US and the UK. A quick uh, couple of comments on screening for activist uh, targets. Um, we ran a series of sort of tests on the, on the stocks that appeared in those indices that we referred to. We took data 30 days prior to the activist appearing on the register and we looked at the valuation price performance of fundamentals. And the key conclusion that we come through is, this is obviously the first st stage of any activist campaign, but more importantly, valuation, it's important, but it's not necessarily the key driver behind it. People certainly look at the absolute um, price performance, but a positive absolute price performance is not an indicator of a target, or nor is a negative one. It's really the relative price performance. More importantly, though, as we fed it through, when we looked at the fundamental forecasts coming in there, it becomes about how the how the entity is generating its profitability and how it's using its balance sheets and its capital controls. No surprise as to why we see the campaigns and they're having those themes, but it's backed up by the empirical data. So anyone looking to screen for stocks that are uh, either potential candidates uh, for which they uh, they may see as um, potential uh, entities that will have activists in, in the future 
or feel that they want to look for, for stocks that, um, that may have risk around activism, essentially, you want to be looking at the, uh, at, at the relative price performance and dr driving it forward onto the fundamentals. Yes, value is important, but it's not the sole determinant uh, to, the, uh, to, to the scenario. A couple of comments on 2021, because I think it is certainly going to become a very interesting year uh, as we go, come through. There's no doubt 2020 was a year to remember, particularly in activism. Uh, we saw a disruption in the flow. The number of total activist uh, campaigns will be down on 2019 as we close out the year by the looks of it. Um, they have, and that, that has been brought around because the uh, corporate investor dialogue has been disrupted uh, and the ability and have to have confidence by the activists that essentially they can uh, they can launch uh, a campaign and manage it in a new found um, era where AGMs have gone virtual or um, the ability to meet with management is through the uh, through the powers of Microsoft Teams or Zoom. But more importantly, 2020 was a year where corporates had to make a series of decisions very rapidly. And in some cases, I think the activists will turn around in 2021 and say, look, some liberties were taken as we came through this crisis, rightly or wrongly. And we would like to, uh, to have them put back onto the agenda. And um, we, we may or may not agree with them. But essentially, 2021, we'll see COVID in the first half um, delays uh, so we're not going to see an, an absolute uh, crescendo as we go out into the uh, into first of January from activists we think it will be a steady ramp up but we do actually feel that there will be activity and it will increase as we go through that 2021 period it may just dis be disrupted by that slow start um, as uh, AGM series uh, come around in uh, in the second quarter but the key themes um, that we're expecting to see around the campaigns is essentially um, fourfold. We're going to see, in our opinion, short-selling activists, and we, we, we haven't in our report necessarily grouped them in as, as activists in a, in a significant way, but a short-selling activist will potentially come in there as valuation dislocations come through. Uh, and we start to see um, a clearer picture of what's gone on in 2021. Moreover, we've got this big push on from ESG. There is some academic um, research which we refer to in the report, which shows that essentially if you have a high ESG score relative to your peers, you are more susceptible uh, to activism. And we think that that will come to the forefront uh, coming through. We expect to see Asia with, with greater voice, though, um, as the uh, as one of the real sort of uh, differentials in 2021, regardless of um, whether or not we see, we see um, a, light, a return to normal. But we do expect to see the activists being a lot more vocal, mainly because of the fact that if we're in a new normal, they're more accommodative of that, and these campaigns do need to flow through. What is also going to be the, uh, the I think, the more prevalent uh, theme within Asia is going to be this private equity uh, participation in public markets. There's a lot of dry powder out there uh, that private equity players are sitting on. They need to deploy it. There are some valuation dislocations. People will take a view on five to seven years and say, look, I can have a, I can have uh, an, an a greater degree of, uh, of flexibility around this and therefore the use of private equity funds to look at private uh, public markets either in a full or partial uh, privatization will also come into uh, to, to, to play the three key campaigns therefore capital management uh, and specifically in japan the use of that cash on the balance sheet the Second area, which arguably could be put into capital management, but still important, is the simple debt overhangs uh, that are present on the balance sheet. We are going to see a degree of fiscal squeezing by banks on the lending facilities. We are going to have to see divestment of assets to fund that. Activists will be certainly at the forefront 
of looking at those balance sheets and the re resolution of any debt overhang that may be in there. And that will drive that third key sort of campaign of M&A. So in summary, uh, just to bring it all to, 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 uh, into a short uh, stage, ESG, regulatory and governance, and a growing acceptance of activism are the, are the key drivers towards what I see as a prolonged era of change within the Asia Pacific area. It will certainly start to flow through into some of the smaller markets or the non-traditional activist markets as we see the, um, the, 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 the flavor come through. But it will generally be done by activists who've got greater than three and a half percent of the register because they know at that point they actually have the years of management and they have the ability to uh, to influence change and agenda at the annual meetings. So with that, Michael, I will leave it over, uh, throw it over to you and any questions that there may be. Thank you very much for that, David. Um, as David said, uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can uh, send them in through the Q&A button on your uh, Zoom app. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, David, I think this was a very, uh, very clear uh, picture that you just painted. Um, but I wonder from the corporate side, uh, what are some of some things that they can do to sort of uh, stave off activists uh, in the boardroom? Um, and your the third part of your um, uh, Smart Karma original uh, act actually focuses on some defense strategies. So uh, could you talk about those uh, uh, real quick? Yeah, we, I will, I'll just pull this up, the slide up. I mean, I think the, the key here, and we've worked with a number of corporates over the years uh, to be ready for, for, for activism and to also uh, influence change in their own uh, agenda or have management actually work as activists. I think that's, the, that's what's interesting about activism. It doesn't always have to be what is the quintessential sort of activist or hedge fund on the street influencing change. It can be one of the stakeholders being an activist. Um, but we really put together in the, in the documents just a little bit of a, a, what I'd say is a roadmap of what needs to be done. The initial steps that the corporates need to do is, is really understand why, why would they be vulnerable to, uh, to an activist rolling up. Um, it may be that they, they understand that through a private conversation because most activist activities start off as a private conversation with management. But if you understand that, then you can start to, uh, to plan for the, for, for the day that you may be impacted by one. Um, if the, the, the reality is when you're exploring that, the corporate really does need to concede that they have vulnerabilities. Um, and they need to go out and address those vulnerabilities. And the best way to do that is to actually build trust with the key investors early on, that they recognise that there may be a weakness in the strategy. And I think also from the reverse side, um, this readiness uh, plan is actually not down just to the corporates to, uh, to go and get themselves organised. It's actually down by the key shareholders to, in their dialogue with management to, to point out that there are vulnerabilities um, and the management need to accept that and plan for it. Um, and that's the second key, uh, key, key strategy that needs to be employed, which is prepare and engage. Um, prepare well ahead of any activist approach because when it does come, it comes generally out of left field. Um, and as you're going through and planning for that, um, you need to have that plan uh, certainly ratified by the board um, and understood, but you need to also have a situation where you're continuously reviewing the plan, the vulnerabilities that are around, because you're, you're in an organisation that changes. That's the one constant that, uh, that any corporate has is change. But when it does actually come to that sort of, you know, day when, when an activist uh, rolls up on that, you need to first and foremost accept that you've actually got something on your doorstep. Um, and that it is a very real um, uh, program of, uh, of activism. It may be that you've had the private conversation and, uh, and you've been given the heads up. It may be that you've had the conversation, not realised that it's a situation uh, brewing and that when it does come out, it comes out at a fairly rapid pace and it comes out in a very public way because of the fact that you'll see, you may see a public letter, you may see a website appear 
um, to come through. But as you, as you see that response, you need to be very objective and allow for consensus to be formed um, within the shareholder, uh, shareholders and, more importantly, the stakeholders, um, be it the regulators or the list and the exchanges um, out there. And what I would encourage, a lot of corporates have been very slow to do this, but I would encourage corporates uh, and their uh, shareholders uh, to encourage them also to use technology to your advantage. Activists are using websites, they're using Twitter, they're using public media to their advantage. There's no reason that a corporate can't do the same. Um, but more importantly, um, build trust around you with those stakeholders that, uh, that you recognise that there's, there's, a, there's a campaign ongoing and that you're actually looking to influence the change and, uh, and you may actually accept the changes and the proposals put forward because the number one thing that we, we can show is that it can generate value and, it, and uh, that creates a win-win situation which therefore also builds the trust in your, uh, in your shareholders. I see. Yeah, I think uh, the technology angle especially is uh, is quite interesting because if I'm not mistaken, these are tactics that we have seen relatively recently and had not been available to either activists or corporates in the past. So it, in a way, it's kind of a, like a whole new world for uh, for both sides to, to sort of uh, get into and implement. Oh, absolutely. You, you're, you're absolutely right there. I mean, the key, the key standouts you've seen... Um, Elliot, Oasis, Lead the Charge in Hong Kong and, um, and, and Japan with their, their campaigns with uh, Bank of East Asia, um, Tokyo Dome uh, in, in particular. But more, more recently, you've seen uh, the courts, uh, Black Crane people uh, establish their, their websites um, and conduct webinars similar to this one around the issues that they, mm. uh, they had. Um, and certainly, you know, that is creating uh, change. Certainly, you know, the US has been been uh, very active on this uh, for, you know, several years uh, gone now. Um, but Asia is just starting to see the, uh, the, the, the campaigns coming through. Uh, and I think that's the, uh, that's the key there. Yeah. Somewhat uh, tangential to this is you mentioned that there is this new generation of activists that's coming up in Asia. Um, and I wonder, are we seeing new tactics from them that we haven't uh, previously observed? Or are they going by the sort of playbooks that we have seen in more mature markets? I think it's the, the traditional playbooks that at the end of the day are... Um, methodical in their uh, in their in their footprint but equally you are starting to see the activists um what should i say being using forensic accounting to their um and background searches uh in more mm -hmm. um, prevalence in in their campaigns um it's certainly been led led out by um by the short sellers um, you know, for example, luck and coffee um, or short sellers come in. Um, we saw uh, Samsonite uh, background behind um, CEOs, CVs uh, being searched um, and, and coming through. We've seen uh, legal challenges uh, being brought. Now, that's simply as a result of the, uh, the way that Hong Kong law came through. But we certainly saw Bank of East Asia. Um, some legal challenges uh, come through. And whilst they were after the uh, corporate event, they have left a marked uh, influence on the, uh, on the campaigns uh, that have been in place. And I think that will continue uh, because people are realising that, you know, there are rights for the minorities and there is a framework and a process that's been put in play place uh, by the, uh, by the uh, regulators and, and, and the legal codes that have been put in place. Uh, so I, I, I foresee that we will continue to see evolution in the way that, um, uh, that these campaigns are run. But I also start to mm -hmm. see that technology in particular will increase the, um, shall I say, the velocity of the, uh, of, of the impact of the campaign. Uh, and that's something that possibly Asia hasn't necessarily seen historically. 
Um, but if it's mm -hmm. done in the right manner and it's it's um, then then it will have a greater impact for uh, for, for, for players coming through. Um, you know, we saw it, whilst we didn't have technology in 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 the areas that we did, but if you have a look at what happened in Australia and New Zealand back in the eighties and night and early nineties, um, the the velocity of it an activist can be quite ferocious on a, on uh, on on a campaign for management where. Arguably, the, the laws have changed now, um, but you used to see the overnight corporate raiders come in and just take a block of stock out that gave them the ability to go down the road and uh, and sit in BHP's offices or or whoever the you know James Hardy's offices at the time and and say, look, I am now a shareholder and I want to influence the change, and I, I foresee that we will you know see technology change the way that these campaigns have uh, have, have um, been run in, in the years to come. And it may actually be that we find whilst the US and UK have led, that we'll actually end up seeing Asia uh, come in and, and deliver its own trends and show that impacts uh, from activism uh, can be done in a different way. Definitely. Uh, I wanted to briefly touch on the, the ESG angle um, that you mentioned. Um, so it, it seems like uh, a higher ESG rating would, would make a corporate um, a, a bigger target potentially for activists, as you mentioned. Um, and I wonder, since we're seeing ESG being a, a bigger uh, theme in, uh, across several markets in Asia, um, how does how do the two reconcile? Will this be a, a sort of deterrent for corporates to to adopt more ESG policies? Do you think? Um, I don't. I think that ESG and the changes that are coming through are incredibly um, incredibly supportive of, um, of 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 what they're actually aimed at doing and improving governance and the environmental and the social uh, aspects of corporates. Um, so I'm a, I'm a good supporter of that, but the research is showing that at the end of the day, if you're too good at it, you're actually denting the profitability that the market expects at that time, and you can be open to to too much ESG uh, on a relative basis. In other words, you know, company A has a you know might have a you know a higher ESG score relative to companies B, C and, and D um, and therefore the the investor feels that hold on we're not actually getting the right return that we should be getting for the uh, for the efforts being made. Um, having said that you know it could be that they're incredibly more efficient and, uh, and therefore have a higher score but the academic research suggests that you're more likely to see an activist roll up on the doorstep. Um, in, in something that is a little bit out of kilter. I think that as the sector improves, that risk goes away. In other words, whether, you know, if, if it's a tight banding, it seems that, that that would improve it. But when there's a significant outlier, having said that, there is also the case um, that the research points to, but we also know from, through um through the way that we we follow these markets and these stocks, that if you have a very low ESG score relative to the sector, you're certainly going to have a few uh, few questions come in, into uh, into play from an activist uh, coming through, and that that will be around you know what are you what are you doing within your organisation? Why why can I not have a greater say in the agenda? Um, why is you know it very much down to a controlling shareholder? Uh, and we have seen those uh, campaigns. In, the, in, the, in a significant way come through. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to kind of uh, round everything up, uh, we, we are a bit over time, but, uh, but that's not a problem. Um, is, there, is there a particular market in Asia that you see, um, uh, see a kind of uh, come to the fore in terms of activist campaigns in 2021. Um, do you think will uh, will we should keep an eye on Japan more, for example, or is there any other markets that you can think of? I think Japan is certainly going to have its um, 
its series of names and depth of activity, uh, no doubt about that. I think certainly the aftermath of um, the win, which is the first time in 18 odd years that Savannah Reit had by activists, is mm. certainly putting the market on notice that activism can be successful for minorities. And that certainly puts Singapore in an interesting light for 2021 because it's a question of whether this is slow change or it's uh, going to embolden the, uh, the, the other actors that are out there. Um, and also, more importantly, give confidence to the retail investor uh, that certainly uh, minority institutions can help uh, influence that. Um, you know, I think as we sit there today, more importantly, though, across Asia, you're going to, I think you will start to see the non-traditional activist uh, voicing a, a louder voice uh, within, the, within the region, uh, within this, these campaigns. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the analyst commentary is not going to be simply about a corporate strategy. It's going to be about anal uh, um, campaigns because if we've got 10% growth and we look at the, uh, the number of campaigns coming through, the odds seem to put it in somewhere around um, a one to 14, one in 14 chance that there'll be an activist campaign on your doorstep in the next couple of years uh, on these, these stocks and subsequently at 10% plus growth in the campaigns, you, you won't be ignoring this, uh, this topic uh, for much longer. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for, for this, David, and thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, if you would like to engage David directly, uh, please contact your Smart Karma account manager, uh, and they will be able to assist. And if you have any other questions, you can always email us at research at smartkarma.com. I want to remind everyone that um, please do not reshare this webinar without uh, express permission. Uh, as always, a recording will be available on the registration page. With that, David, thank you once again. And uh, I want to wish uh, happy holidays to everyone and uh, have a good day.